This is a HeadGum Podcast. Support for the Black Girl Nerds podcast comes from my girl, Tara Reed, the non-technical founder behind appswithoutcode.com. This stuff is bananas. Tara helps other non-technical folks build apps without writing a single line of code. Yeah, seriously. I was talking to Tara the other day, and guess what? She's got a free toolkit packed with everything you need to get started. Just text TOOLKIT1 to 44222, and Tara will send it right over. You can start building apps like a boss, no code required. If you thought you had to be a programmer to be successful in tech, that's a bunch of BS. Tara can prove it. She's gotten into 500 startups, landed $300,000 in investment, and has made hundreds of thousands of dollars in revenue, all from the apps she built by herself without writing a single line of code. If you're like me and you've got all kinds of ideas for apps, websites, or startups, Get going. Text Toolkit1 to 44222. Hey there, this is Ava DuVernay, creator of Queen Sugar on OWN, and you're listening to the Black Girl Nerd Podcast. This is Ben Jones with Yes We Code. You are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Hey, y'all. This is LeVar Burton, Kunta, Jordy, Reading Rainbow Guy. You are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. It is the bomb diggity podcast on the interwebs, but you don't have to take my word for it. This is Simone Missick, and I am Misty Knight, and you are listening to the Black Girl Nerds Podcast. Yo, what's up? This is Shale Hadari Coker, the showrunner and creator and executive producer of Marvel's Luke Cage. You're listening to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Thanks for tuning into episode 91 of the Black Girl Nerds podcast. My name is Jamie and I am your host. This episode is titled Better Days and Documentary Filmmaking. Two segments. In our first segment, we invite Veronica Wells. She is the culture editor over at MadameNoir.com and she has a new novel called Better Days about a girl growing up with her grandmother. A coming-of-age story, if you will. In that segment, it's a one-on-one hosted by Karan. In our second segment, we invite filmmaker Raul Peck. He has a new documentary film out called I Am Not Your Negro about the life of James Baldwin, which premiered over at the 2016 Toronto International Film Festival, hosted by Jacqueline. So that's it. We're keeping it short and sweet. Check us out this weekend over at New York Comic Con. We're having another Black Girl Nerds of Color meetup. If you were with us over at San Diego, you're familiar with these meetups. If not, please come by, check it out. You're totally invited. It's going to be October the 7th. That's on a Friday at 8 to 10 p.m. over at Bullmore Lanes. You do need tickets to attend. The cover is $15 and it's $20 at the door. You'll have a lot of fun at this event, and we're sharing the space with other folks that are having parties over at Bullmore Lanes, and you have access to some lanes and some free bowling. 
So come on out and join us in fellowship with your favorite nerds, blurds, and geeks of color. Meet your old friends and make some new ones. It should be a lot of fun. I'll be on a few panels over at New York Comic Con, and if I don't get a chance to connect with you, at least come by our meetup and we can connect then. BGN 91 coming at you. Veronica Wells was born and raised in Indianapolis, Indiana, with more than a splash of influences in the American South and Jamaica. She lives in Harlem and works in New York City as the culture editor for MadameNoir.com, a black women's lifestyle site. You can follow her work at VeronicaRWells.com. Hey, you guys, it's Karan here. Welcome to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Today we have a special treat. Veronica R. Wells is the culture editor for the Black Women's Lifestyle site, MadameNoir.com. You know it, I know it, we love it. In her first book, Better Days, she takes us on a journey of her own lineage, the story of her grandmother. It is heartfelt, deeply moving, it is a powerful work, and it's now available on Amazon.com. Veronica, welcome to the Black Girl Nerds podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You're so sweet. That introduction was beautiful. (laughs) Thank you. I do try. Thank you. (laughs) So we're going to get into the book in just a moment, but I'd like for you to share with us a little bit about your work at MadameNoir.com. Okay. So I'm the culture editor at Madame Noir, which means I basically get to do a little bit of everything, which is what I love about the job. I get to do anything I want. So a lot of freedom. <laughs> you know, I, I love to talk about what's going on in the world and then provide my opinion from, you know, a black woman's perspective. Even if people don't agree with me, I'm able to speak freely on the site, which is what I love. And we do some editings. We do talk about love, relationships, current events, anything that black women are interested in, we are able to talk about and discuss on that noir. So tell me why you decided to write a novel. There's so many different kinds of books out here to write. We see these Mm -hmm. self-help books that are blowing up, but not a whole lot of novels. Mm -hmm. Tell me why you decided to write a novel. You know, I think you can, the saying is true that you just write what you know. And um, Mm -hmm. what I know is my grandmother's story. And that's what I've known. And it's my, you know, it's my story. It's our family story. So it's what I've known basically all my life since I was old enough to understand stories and lessons and morals. So it's just something that's been on my heart. I mean, since I was in elementary school, when my grandmother passed away at 16, when I was 16, um, you know, it was just, I just realized that so many of my family members didn't know things that I knew about her. I feel like that was such a tragedy because, you know, my grandmother, I felt was such a dynamic woman with such an amazing story. And if her own family members didn't know Mm -hmm. about it, it was a shame that she, that she had left the world and they didn't even know what type of woman and what type of legacy she left behind for us. You know, I felt like it was important for me to share those stories, not only for my family, but for so many other women and so many other families, because I feel like the stories that, that happened to my grandmother and to my grandfather and her children, they're unique to our family, but they are, but they are universal stories and themes, you know, everyone's Mm -hmm. family is crazy. Everyone's family has a level, a level, you know, a level (laughs) of dysfunction. And someone said to me last night, um, you know, if you believe your family doesn't have issues, that in itself is an issue. So that is, that's to me, I wanted to write the book to expose some things, let some things, let people know that some things are not okay. And then for healing and forgiveness. And I think that's the ultimate purpose for the book is about moving forward and making the best decisions for yourself. Now, the book speaks about some difficult times and Mm -hmm. some even more difficult decisions. These are not the typical conversations we have with our mothers and our grandmothers and the ones that came before them. Mm -hmm. Much of what you wrote is what we discover either after they've left us or we we get it in those golden nuggets when we're trying to pick ourselves up off the floor and they're the only ones that can help. (laughs) How was it received by your family? You know, it's it's been such, this book has been such a blessing to my family because, and I didn't really know how they were going to take it. I felt like, you know, some people would be offended that we were, that I was putting this story out there, but I knew that my intentions were pure. 
So I didn't feel I've had moments, but I didn't. But ultimately, I knew I was doing the right thing. So my family, this book has opened up so many so much conversation and so much dialogue between the generations and people, you know, are coming to me like, thank you so much for writing this book. I had no idea or it made me look at myself it made me realize things I need to change about myself. It made me realize that I need to break a cycle that I didn't realize I was Mm -hmm, perpetuating, mm -hmm. you know. Tears have been shed, you know, come to Jesus meetings. So, I mean, I just, and then um, the grandchildren that my grandmother didn't get to meet have, you know, felt like, okay, this is my connection to her. And I just, you know, that is such a blessing Mm -hmm. because, and and something I really couldn't have even foreseen in writing this book initially. How did you conduct your research? You said that Mm -hmm. your grandmother passed when you were 16 and your grandmother was Jamaican? Yeah, she's Jamaican. She's Mm -hmm. Jamaican. So Mm -hmm. how did you conduct your research and how... You know, we, we used to have Mm -hmm. a very rich tradition, just black people in general, a very rich tradition of oral history in our culture. Mm. I grew up with griots and you don't see very many of those anymore. So how did you discover this oral history? How did you really get your research done about your grandmother in that time? Mm. Okay. So my grandmother and I had a very, very close relationship and I feel like you know, when I was thinking about it, I feel like my grandmother is like my soulmate in a lot mm-hmm. of different ways. And just from a young girl, I, I was, I've always been like a very nosy and observant child. And I would just ask my grandmother questions. And I feel like I was asking her questions that a lot of people didn't even think to ask her. Mm-hmm. So she saw that I was interested. And so she would just tell me these stories. And we would, you know, as I got older and older, she would tell me more and more, you know, felt like, okay, she's mature enough to handle this now. She's mature enough to handle this now. And I would just ask questions. And so my grandmother told me a lot of the stories. Then um, my aunts and my mother filled in the gaps. And then my grandmother's niece told me a lot of stories. And then other things that I've heard from, really, it's been like a lifelong research of collecting these stories from different people in the family. And I've just pieced them all together. Do you think these are the kinds of talks we should be more open about with our young women and our daughters? Definitely. Definitely. I mean, we have to, you know, the thing is, I feel like the proudest I am of my grandmother is that she made sure that her daughters didn't repeat her mistakes. Mm-hmm. And I think she did that. And just by being honest, you know, I feel like some, so many times we preach to children and young people about what they shouldn't do, what they shouldn't do, what they shouldn't do. And sometimes but don't, it tell just, them why. But don't tell them why, you know, <laughs> yeah. and I think even if you just had a conversation, like, listen, I did that too. And this is what happened for me. So you can make your own decision, but I just want to let you know that this is what's, well, this is what's, ha- this is what can happen from this decision and just be honest and I feel like with my grandmother doing that, you know, her daughters were able to see they first off, they were able to see living in that home and in that situation that it wasn't what they wanted for themselves. But then on top of that, she was just very honest with her life experiences and they were able to make better choices. Would your grandmother's truth have been well received in her time if she were open about it back then? I think my grandmother shared her truth with the people she could. And that mm-hmm. was her daughter's. And I think if she had tried to share it with anyone else, I do not think it would have been as well received. Yeah, no, I don't think it would have been as well received. But because just because people didn't have even not the emotional capacity, but I don't even know some it's less some level of maybe like emotional ignorance to even they wouldn't have been able to handle or process what she Mm -hmm. was saying, you know, and now we just have more discussions about feminism and women's rights and equality that. You know, people are able to mm-hmm. uh, to read the story, and understand how heinous and tumultuous her life was, you know, whereas back then it was kind of just like, OK, well, that's just the way it is. And you just have to deal with it. That's the woman's lot in life. So now right. um, we're able to understand that these things aren't right and they don't have to continue happening. One of the most powerful things about this book, and it's really it was really difficult to put mm, down. Thanks. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome, girl. Congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to tell you, after this weekend with Queen yeah. Sheba, I don't know what to do with myself. I'm so emotional. But there's there's this connectivity that runs through the entire story. Everything from the language to the landscapes you paint with your words. It is a really powerful work. How long did it take you to finish the project? Thank you. Two years wow. when I got serious about it. I tell people, you know, I've been thinking about this book for a long time. But when I actually got serious about writing it, I put myself in a schedule So every day after work, which was very difficult, I would, you know, commit to writing four pages Mm -hmm. and four pages a day, you know, and, and that was just in. So after I did the four pages, then I took some time away from it to, you know, just let it 
just simmer for a little bit because mm-hmm. reading your own work right after you've written a rough draft is like torture. It is. So, <laughs> you know, it's very hard. <laughs> but what I will say to anyone who's aspiring to write anything, I got this book that really helped me clear my mind and organize my thoughts in a way that has just beneficial. I can't speak about it enough. It's called How to Write a Damn Good Novel. It just helped you like with a step sheet. And one of the biggest things he wrote about in the book is that when you're writing, don't try to edit as you're writing, Mm -hmm. just get it out. And I've said this so many times, I feel like the first draft is kind of like vomiting. You just get it out and then you clean it up later. You know, I think Um, when I got serious about writing, that was the most (laughs) accurate description of, (laughs) of getting it out that it is, it is, you got to get everything out in the sky and and you don't feel that relief that the relief of that pressure until you do when exactly when did you know you wanted to be a writer you know I've wanted to be a writer since I was seven years old my mother bought me well the thing is and I feel like it's hand in hand my parents have everyone's parents shaped their identity but my parents really fostered my gifts in a way that is just I'm so grateful and so thankful for. I feel like, you know, in order to be a good writer, you have to be a, a reader. And my father was, you know, yes. my father was the one who promoted reading and literacy in our in our house and he was always reading and so I wanted to read and he was always, you know, asking me about the books that I read and we were we lived across the street from the library. So, I mean, I just had a a childhood full of very rich literary work. So there was that and then my mother bought me a diary when I was 7 years old. Mm. And just the action of just writing down my thoughts made me feel, number one, it made me feel important. And it made me know that I had a voice that was important. And I just the act of writing and even rereading what I had written was just so profound to me. So my parents really had a huge, they played a huge role in just fostering, I felt was like a, what, what was a God-given gift, you know? Don't you just love it when you meet someone who says they are a writer and you ask them the last thing you read and they're like, uh. Yeah, like, you know, that's not, that's, that's no bueno. It's not good. <laughs> <laughs> Let's be real. You're, you're the culture editor for this huge media outlet. You're multi-talented. Mm. You have a, a lot of other things that you do. You're really great on camera. You're really mm. great on paper. Oh, thank you. What made you decide for this to be your first um, published work? Just because it was, it was something that I, that I wanted to do for so long. I didn't even really even think about it in that context. So I don't think, I've just known I've always wanted to write something. And I didn't know what it was going to be, but I feel like this story, you know, you hear these stories as a, as a child and you don't necessarily know how profound and how universal the themes are. And I think the older I got and the more I saw the people around mm-hmm. me, I was like, you know what? A lot of people have these stories or a lot of people could relate to this or a lot of people, I wish a lot of people, I wish my grandmother was here to talk to these people. I wish my grandmother was here to talk to this person. Or I wish, you know, if they had if they had access to my grandmother, maybe they would think differently about certain mm-hmm. situations, you know? And I would think about that a lot, actually. And it's funny, I never even thought about this until you just asked me this question. When I meet women, I would think, you know, they could really benefit from speaking to my grandmother. And my grandmother's gone. So I feel like telling her story in this way just lets her spirit and her legacy live on for people who would have never met her. I can't say enough about it. I mean, it was just, I'm still like, I go back and read that last page at least twice a day. I'm just like, Oh my God. (laughs) Because it is so, we don't talk about death. We don't talk about passing. We don't talk about being, I mean, there's no real way to prepare for it. We can think we're prepared. We can think we're ready, but there's a period of time when our ancestors, our, the people who gave birth to us, the people who have raised us, kind of help us along the way to finding peace that they're no longer here. Yes. And yes. the way that you expressed that was just so incredibly beautiful. I just, this is a work to be You honored. are about to make me really, cry. really, really an incredible work. Thank you so much <laughs> for this contribution. Oh my God. Girl, let me tell you, because, <laughs> girl, I'm so emotional. <laughs> but- no, really, I, it really, it really is wonderful. And I just, it's beautiful. It's really a beautiful work. And it's not, it's not just all, you know, so deep that you drown. It's, it's, there's a lot of humor in there. Oh there's a, God. there's a connectivity and a warmth that comes mm-hmm. with this work that, that really, mm-hmm. you, you found your voice, girl. This is your time. So congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. I cannot tell you what that means to me. It just, thank you so much. Do you have any advice out there for aspiring writers? Oh, God. Okay, now let me just, <laughs> let, me just wipe my, <laughs> let me wipe my eyes for a okay. second and catch my breath. 
<laughs> um, you know what? I would just say if you believe in the story you have to tell, then you have to believe that there is someone who could benefit from it, you know? And mm -hmm. I just... When I was writing this, when I was, when I first started writing this book, I just felt like an imposter, a fraud, right? Like here I am pretending to be a writer or pretending to be an author. I write every single day for a living mm -hmm. and I still felt like inadequate, you know? So I would say that you need to believe in yourself. And the thing is not, it's not when you do these, when you write something, when you put a piece of art when you put your heart into the world, it's not just for you. And I think that's the biggest lesson yeah. that I'm learning in the, in the fact that this book is out here. It's that it's the comments, like the ones you just made to me. It's the, it's the healing that my family is experiencing from this book. It's the people who've said, you know, you pursuing your passion and goal and you telling me that you were going to write a book and actually doing it makes me know that I can do that. I can pursue my dream too. And so I feel like what you have to know going into it, when you're doing anything that's difficult when you're doing anything that requires your dedication, your discipline, your determination, you have to know that it's going to help someone else. Even just the mere act of you doing it. There are people who will never buy my book who've been inspired by me writing a book, you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is why people have to pursue your dreams because I go, I go to church and I go to F FCBC, First Corinthians Baptist Church, and they talk about mm -hmm. all the time they talk about pursuing your dreams and pursuing your passions. And he says, you know, creation is waiting. And that means mm. like the world is waiting for your gift, for your voice, for your contribution. And I believe that sincerely, if you have a desire in your spirit, that's your permission to do it and, and follow it through. I'm just seeing that in my own life and it's blowing my mind really. It's so funny. You said that I had a, a teacher, <laughs> you about to make me cry. I had a, a, a voice coach. Um, I sang classical voice for a long time and I was coming through a healing process where I had had some difficulty with my lungs and with breathing mm. for a while. And I just, I'd stopped singing mm. for a long time. And it was our, our third class together, our third time together. And she looked at me and she said, okay, that's enough. And I said, what? I'm thinking I'm doing everything right. And she says, mm -hmm. you must intrude on the world with your voice. Yes. The earth is waiting to hear it. And I have carried that with me. So to hear you say those words is confirmation for me. So I'm just, I'm full of gratitude right now. Thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. Listen, mm. it's real, you know, mm. it's real. It's real. And I, and I feel like so many times we, we feel we yeah. know things in our soul. And we push it down and we push it down and we push it down and life gets in the way and makes you feel inadequate or unprepared or, or whatever. But when you feel it in your soul, that is your permission from God. And I don't mean to preach a sermon, but like that is your permission. That's real. And you were supposed to, mm -hmm. you were supposed to pursue mm -hmm. it for, uh, for not, not just, just for yourself, you, your gift's not for not you. About, it's not just mm -hmm. for you. It's for other people. Absolutely. So what would you say to seven year old Veronica, who's just oh beginning to think about writing? You know, I would just tell her that, um, see, this is, <laughs> this interview was taking me a direction I did not anticipate, but anytime I really talk about this book, seriously, I start crying, but, um, I would tell her that her voice is more important than she thinks. And there are people who are interested in her thoughts and the things that she has to share. And I would tell her that she is smart enough. She is capable enough. And um, she's going to help a lot of people. The book is called Better Days. <laughs> Veronica R. Wells, thank you so much. Tell us where we can find you online. You can find me online at veronicarwells.com. You can purchase the book on Amazon, Barnes & Noble. If you see me in the street, I might have a copy. <laughs> <laughs> did you self-publish? Uh, I did. I did. I thought so. You better go ahead with the thing. You did the damn thing, girl. You did it. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. So um, Veronica R. Wells or MadamNoir.com. Yeah, that's where you can find me. I'm around. Twitter at um, VW Shrug on Instagram and we'll, Twitter. And then Facebook. We will make sure yeah. we, we have that information up. Thank you so much for your time. Bet Today's is well worth your time. Pick it up. Read it. Amazon.com. It is available in paperback as well as digital. So please pick it up when you get a yes. chance. Thank you so much, Veronica. Thank you so much. This is beautiful.
Raoul Peck is a Haitian filmmaker of both documentary and feature films. He's also a political activist. In 2005, he made a film called Sometimes in April, starring Idris Elba. This year, at the Toronto International Film Festival, he premiered his latest documentary called I Am Not Your Negro. The film explores history of race relations in the United States through Baldwin's memories of civil rights leaders, such as Medgar Evers, Malcolm X, and Martin Luther King Jr. The film is narrated by actor Samuel L. Jackson. I Am Not Your Negro won the People's Choice Award in the documentary category, and it was picked up for theatrical distribution by Magnolia Pictures. Hi, Raul. Thank you for sitting down with us today to talk about I'm Not Your Negro, the James Baldwin documentary. First of all, I saw it yesterday. It's absolutely amazing. I, I, I left the theater and I like had to sit down for a minute to like think about the film. So I know it's a bit of a labor of love for you. Tell me about the, the journey it took to bring this to life. Well, uh, it, it is. Uh, it's one of these films where, where you, you basically have no choice. And, and for me, I knew uh, once I had my hands on the rights, which I got 10 years ago mm -hmm. through the estate, who really embraced my work and trusted me for, for all these long years, never put any pressure on me. So I really took time to find the film, to find out what film I wanted to make. Uh, and I knew it had to be the ultimate film, not only about Baldwin, but from Baldwin. Mm -hmm. So the idea was from, from was from the get go that I was just going to be the messenger. Yeah. So and you then, always plan to have it be oh yes, his words. Oh yes. Oh, yes. Wow. I, I never saw this film with any, uh, you know, any other scholar interpreting Baldwin or anybody talking about Baldwin. I didn't want any talking heads in that film. I wanted to put Baldwin center stage and be inside his head. He's the one doing the talking. Uh, he changed the life of many people, including mine. My um, goal was to put those words out, and in a time where we really need them. Yeah, I mean, the film intercuts Baldwin's words, his interviews, with modern day, I would say, parallels from, you know, the young African American males who've been shot by the police the current situation as far as uh, black neighborhoods. I mean, there's just so much of what he dealt with that moves still to this day. When did that part come into it? Was that also from the inception that you knew you wanted to have it, have some modern day influences? Well, f first of all, I knew uh, from the text that it was modern day. That's the incredible part of it. You know, if you read Baldwin today, and I hope that's what the film will force people to do, to Go back to Baldwin. You know, everybody should have his Baldwin in the back of his pocket you know, mm -hmm. for everyday life, for everyday need. That's how you need Baldwin. You know, and so I knew that rereading everything and and words and and books that have you know formed me, that have formed my my brand and my politics uh, and my engagement. I knew it was about today. You know, it, it was never separated in my head. It was not a film about the past. It was a film about today and how we can use film to be engaged today, especially this generation right now, who did not benefit of the civil rights movement, who did not learn eventually how to organize, who only know the civil rights movement from its results and not what it meant. To or be white textbook. every day yeah. uh, in the streets, or confronting the police, confronting the establishment, confronting the press, etc., etc. So that's like a, a, to return to that. It's to return to school mm -hmm. and to learn how to fight. That's so powerful too. Because the other thing about Baldwin, I was so surprised with is I'm sure you were too. Not a lot of people know how involved he was not only with the civil rights movement but with sort of black renaissance and everything why do you feel he's not as well known i would say within that uh, uh, it, it was because of of the history when first of all he was one of the first one if not the first one to be as well a bright writer uh, an established writer recognized you know he was the front, uh, cover page of time magazine he was everywhere, Dick Cavett show, uh, you know, to have almost an hour 
as a guest in Dick Cavett's show, which uh, in a time where there was only three networks, you know, that means meant something. So he was really, and he, the way he could talk and speak and interact, you couldn't say no to him. So he was everywhere where you would, you know, if you had to invite, invite Malcolm X or Martin Luther King, it was more delicate. But Baldwin, he was an intellectual, he was accepted everywhere, and he kept his voice. He never compromised on what, whatever he was saying. So when we got, when the fight got bloodier, when they stopped, uh, you know, the Black Panther came to light and to fight, and then they start killing those people. And Baldwin was, uh, for some people in the movement, considered like uh, has been, mm. which of course he was not. But he was trying to be among his brothers and sisters. And he looked at, like, the, uh, the Black Panther leadership. He looked at them as his sons, his daughters. So he did, he, although he did not agree with everything, but he never criticized them openly. He tried to be like the father. And this position, of course, in the, in the time of polemic, put him aside more and more. And then we got to the time where, you know, we, we created the mythology of Martin Luther King and much less of Malcolm X. And, and once you get to the stage where you are building statues and you have a Martin Luther King day and you're covering up everything. Mm. You know? And it's not so surprised that Baldwin is coming out now again. And when you start rereading it, you see how... Not only visionary he was, but how present he is, and his how uh, you know right his analysis were, you know, and you can just use his word as a as a powerful you know day book you know everyday book to know how to deal with the system. That's when you you see that you are confronted with a classic. Mm-hmm. Baldwin is classic. He's the father of everybody else. Every writer, black writer, man and woman who is writing today, they come from Baldwin. I would agree. And it's time to recognize that. Very much so, yeah. I, this was on the top list of uh, films that I wanted to see when I came to TIFF. You mentioned Malcolm and Martin, and the one thing I, I noticed during the documentary as well is the fact that his life was sort of punctuated by death, essentially, yeah, yeah, throughout yeah. you know each chapter. Can you talk, I mean, the film talks about it, but can you talk about how when you notice that, how it sort of sort of dictated the, the storyline with that? You know, once you are engaged in, in the story of your own people, it's not something that is just an intellectual exercise. You know, you live with it every day. You feel it in your bones, in your heart, in your blood. So each time you, you are hurt, like you can be hurt by the death and not only just the death, but the assassination of people you knew, of people you, you fought with, of people you believe in. It's really, it's profound, and it marks you forever. And Baldwin was in that generation where he saw all these people died one after the other. You know, there is this line he says in the film, like, uh, he felt he was older than all of them. They were all young. They died before they were 40. And he said, well, normally the elder is supposed to die first. And all these peers were just being slaughtered. And he carried that with him today. Like, like we all carry, you know, I, I carry every day what is going in Syria. I carry every day what, when uh, people are bombed in Pakistan or Afghanistan or uh, in, in Palestine and elsewhere in Africa. So, this is, if you are concerned and, uh, and conscious of what's going on in the world today, and every young black man or, or child being killed in the street of our city uh, here today, this is like my own son every time. You know, you can't be just a little bit outside or a little bit inside. Mm-hmm. Either you, 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 you feel it through and you carry on with it, with the burden it is, and then you fight against it, or you, you just stay away. But people like Baldwin, they felt it every day of their life. They were not just carrying on their own difficult life because it was not easy for Baldwin as an intellectual gay 
black man in a time where of, of great prejudice and or to say the best paternalism, it was hard every day for him. So this was uh, also not only a personal struggle, but it was, uh, you know, a political struggle and uh, of which, you know, you felt uh, everything was on your shoulder. And I can feel like uh, how somebody like Baldwin would feel every day. And especially when you have, when you feel that you're not a center stage anymore, you know, that people tend to put you aside, like you, you are almost an Uncle Tom. Yeah, because he was embraced a little bit by the mainstream. And I think, you know, again, at that time frame, that was the worst taboo ever, course, you know. Um, the other thing I was going to say, so there's tons of parallels to modern day. But just recently, I mean, not a week ago, we have Colin Kaepernick, who chooses not to stand during the national anthem yeah. at the NFL game. And that is a black man making a protest. And in the film, Baldwin talks about how, you know, White America is allowed to protest and they're allowed to rabble rouse, but the Negro is never allowed to do that. I found that to be one of the best parallels that I could see. What do you think he would say about that situation right now today? I think he would find it ridiculous, first of all. And totally, you know, it's like as if we are looking for any small event, any small reason to discriminate against anyone who is showing that he, he, he doesn't agree with how the system is functioning. Uh, you can't be speaking about freedom of speech every day, even, by the way, freedom of carrying a weapon, and then you're making such a fuss about somebody not standing for the flag. Is it two type of freedom? So it has to go with that young man who just decided it is a way to protest. I don't understand the polemic, by the way. And we know today that patriotism is not always <laughs> the right, uh, you know, flag to, to, to be behind. You know, uh, with patriotism, it's a way of uh, disconnecting your brand, you know, and you can go into any war and just go kill other people without knowing why. That's why you have, you know, people like uh, Muhammad Ali who refused to go to Vietnam, Martin Luther King who said stop bombing Vietnam, you know, the Vietnamese never did anything to us, meaning us black people. So there is no reason. It's not because you, you can love a flag, you can love your country, but that doesn't mean that you have to accept what authorities of your country. By the way, they are elected, and that doesn't mean they are God. You know, and you can contradict them. You can be uh, think contrary to what whatever they think, or not accept their their decisions. You know that involves you, and by the way, involves your own life. So you are it's it's uh, your rights to question certain decision and certain action that your country are very often doing in other people's country. Yeah, you have to be aware. I will also say, too, the, the film is narrated beautifully by Samuel L. Jackson. Um, how did he come to be a part of the film? Well, we, we had a list of uh, several names of black actors who, who I respected and who I thought were, were, could be the, the voice I was looking for. But there were certain things that uh, somebody like Samuel Jackson brought on the table that were, beside the fact that he's one of the, the great actors, of our generation, but also that actor or not, he embodied somebody I always hear, you know, talking about his life, him being a black actor, him being in Hollywood, and uh, he has a certain street credibility for me that was important. I could not just give this voice to just anybody. I know there is some cliches sometimes about him, and the job he does, but when you hear him talk, you know that there is another person behind, and that's the uh, this other person that I needed. And when we proposed that to him, he really accepted, and and uh, he was very uh, humble, uh, you know, approaching this text of Baldwin, this word, these words, and uh, it was great working with him. And and I think his his participation and and the way he translate those words are, are key to the success of, of this film. 
Yeah, I mean, his voice um, in the film, I feel, is, is different than what a lot of people yes, would normally yeah, hear yeah. him as. And that's the best part, I feel, too, about yeah. that. Is it, it, I needed the real voice. I, really, I didn't need an actor. I needed, in fact, I directed as I would direct an actor, you know, starting a theater role. You know, you have to struggle with the text, learn the text, and be the text. You know, you're not reading it. You are it. And that's how I approach it. And like, you are very humbly talking to your best friend sitting in a chair on the porch and you're telling him the story. That was the only direction he needed. Oh, that's excellent. Well, I mean, I watched it. I felt the story. I do think it's a tragedy, like I said, that more people do not know about James Baldwin and his history. I'm so glad that the film is going to bring it to new audiences, especially young black minds. If you could talk to someone, you know, let's say under the age of 25, under the age of 30, and give them maybe just one quote or one little James Baldwin thing for them to understand him as the man. I know he's got a lot and it's oh, hard. It's got, uh, <laughs> you know, it, it's, it's hard uh, for me because I'm not, first of all, I'm not best in, in quoting. Yeah. But I would say, you know, if you want to start reading Baldwin, just read The Fire Next Time. It's a small book. It doesn't take, even if you don't like to read, it's easy to read. It's a very thin book. And once you get to that, you will read all Baldwin. Just start the fire next time, and then that will be your entry point into Baldwin's work. Excellent. Well, we're going to link a lot of his work in our review that we're putting out at the end of TIFF, but thank you for sitting down with us and chatting. Thank you for this conversation. uh, The movie is excellent, and I I really hope that it gets to a wide theater because it has to be seen. For me, it's the beginning. uh, The film is not the end. The film is the beginning of a very, very long conversation that is needed now, and a conversation without the usual you know, uh, politically correctness, because like this, there is no real conversation. (laughs) And that's what Baldwin said. He he put us back with the real world and we can look at each other eye to eye. All right, well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. The Black Girl Nerds podcast is produced by Jamie Broadnax. Various segments on all podcast episodes are edited by M.R. Daniel and John Bauer. The opening theme song to our podcast is written and performed by Samus. Various instrumentals used throughout podcast episodes are created by Samus, Sky Blue, and Shubzilla. You can find our shows on iTunes, SoundCloud, Spreaker, Google Play Music, and Stitcher. That was a HeadGum Podcast.